the acceptance of the fact that growth is going to come from within makes what I do, what my team does, our account managers, more important than ever. Uh, because and it's it's a sweet spot. It's gone from being, oh, it, it's nice to keep customers happy. Oh, no, 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 no. There is nothing more important than keeping your customers happy and growing with them. Welcome back to another episode of the Sales Gravy Podcast. With me today is Barry Klein. Barry is the VP of Success and Enablement with a company called Talaru. And we're going to learn more about Talaru in just a moment. But it's going to be a fantastic conversation around customer experience, customer success, and retaining your customers, which in this particular environment is super important. Before we get started, I want you to go check out Sales Gravy University. Now, Sales Gravy University is different than any other digital learning platform out there for sales because we have on-demand courses over a thousand hours from the top experts in the world and like the Peloton of selling in that we have live courses by our master trainers every single week that you can come in and join as a team or as an individual. And this is why sales teams, small and large across the world, are coming to Sales Gravy to learn how to sell more. And if you've never been to Sales Gravy, if you've never taken a course there, you can take your very first course for free by using the code free course. Just go to learn.salesgravy.com. That's learn.salesgravy.com. Use the code free course, any course you want. And I think you're going to love the experience. Barry, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, before we get started, I'm going to give you a chance to tell people a little bit about yourself and what you do at Talaru and maybe just a little bit about your company. And then we're going to jump into why customer success has suddenly become so important for businesses in this environment. Good job. Thank you so much for having me on. And it really is an honor. I'm very flattered to be here with you. Um, a little bit about myself. I am a uh, originally from the Northeast, grew up in New Jersey, where my family still is. I'm speaking to you from Austin, Texas, which is where uh, Talru has its headquarters. Um, my my journey to my role here at Talru uh, had, uh, a, you know, as with most, most careers, a little winding along the way. Uh, I was a computer science major by training, but by the time I graduated college, I wasn't a bad coder, but I'd had enough of it. And what I really found what I enjoyed doing was being able to translate technology for non-technical folks. And that led to a career uh, in uh, engineering support and then uh, pre-sale support, sales engineering, which uh, really helped shape my, my views um, on what's most important to customers, relationships with salespeople, uh, how to run an effective enterprise class sales cycle. Uh, so all those things came into play. I took a day, uh, a little bit of a uh, side movement in the early 2000s where living out a lifelong dream with my best friend from high school, we opened our own health club and expanded it and did those kinds of things. So I had the pleasure of being an entrepreneur. But then you decide that it's a lot easier sometimes when someone else writes the checks every two weeks for you. You know, it's nice to be paid rather than be the one making the payment. Um, so that brought me back to the technology world. And when I found my way to what was at first uh, called Jobs to Careers, well, talk a little bit a little bit more about that but now tell um and that that intersection of service and education and technology still is uh, an exciting place for me tell me a little bit about the customer base at Talru. um you know what Talru is a talent matching platform uh folks will often you know as by way of building an analogy think of Indeed or ZipRecruiter, those kinds of uh, companies where we are helping people find jobs. The key difference for Telru um, at a high level is that we are a marketplace for job advertising and for advertising uh, events. We focus on essential and frontline workers. Um, and our goal is to ha help our customers find unique audiences that they otherwise wouldn't find because we're not a destination website. You're not going to you know, turn on your satellite radio, as I so often do, and hear ads for uh, Indeed.com or ZipRecruiter or other .coms. We are plumbing, in a sense. We're behind the scenes. And so our challenge is uh, to have our customers appreciate where we can fit into the mix, that we are a little bit different. Um, I will often say, as I work with our newest salespeople, what we do is very simple in that it's how I would explain it to my mother. Mom, I sell job ads. You know how they used to be in the newspaper? Well, now they're online. What we do is simple. How we do it 
is much more sophisticated and a little bit more challenging for our customers to understand, which has an impact on the sales cycle. It has an impact on uh, customer go live. And certainly it has an impact on the long-term relationships that we build because we are not a set it and forget it kind of solution. We really need our customers to be partners. And it sounds like a like it, it's trite or that it's a sound bite. But when our customers really work with us as partners, we can make things sing and dance. And we used to work with with you guys when when we had a job board. So sales gravy mm-hmm. for, for most of our of our existence, we were a top tier sales job board, which we exited that business back in 2018 and uh, mm-hmm. and moved uh, full, fully into sales training. Uh, but, but you are, it was a, it was a, it's a different world. But the one thing that I would say, knowing the space that you're in is that when it comes to customer success, account management, customer experience, it's crazy challenging. Uh, yes. because, and I want to talk a bit about this because if you think about your world, you're, you've, you've got a company, they're looking for a person and everybody's looking for an edge. So you can go post on the big job boards. I mean, we're, we're hiring a bunch of people right now, and it can be super frustrating from a recruiting standpoint. They have a tendency to take it out on you when things aren't going very well. So talk yes. a little bit about that with your particular customer base. And because I look, we one of the reasons we exited the business was because it was like, this is not a lot of fun. Like it's just, it's just a lot of work. I mean, kind of like you're, you know, taking care of a gym. Like it was a lot of work and we get yelled at a lot. And, and, and that, I that, that, you know, I guess that concept of the customer being a partner, especially with what you do, and I know your business, mm-hmm. I know what you do very well. It does matter, but not not every customer is willing to step into that partnership. No, it it really is true, and it's funny. You know, I I took away some sound bites and life lessons from my days with the health club, and if anyone has never worked directly with the general public in an ongoing basis, you know, God bless the folks who are working retail at the holidays and doing things like that. You know, uh, and when a a parent would lose their cool in our lobby and yell and scream because there was no room for their child in our babysitting. We'd always have to remind the staff, it's never about babysitting. That's not what they're yelling about. They're yelling at you because they can. Something else is bothering them. And having that bit of a thick skin and patience with the people is incredibly important for my team and for, uh, and the, the appreciation for what our customers are going through is vitally important. Uh, for our mutual success because as you say not all of them are ready to i don't know if i want to say step up but they're they're not looking for a partnership they want a vendor sell me something and take care of my problems um you know and we for us it's even uh more challenging because we don't have an annual contract we are not a SaaS solution we have to earn our customers business every month they can cancel whenever they want and it is it can be remarkably frustrating if we miss any signal whatsoever One bad week could cause someone to cancel. Um, We have had incidents when we've updated um, something you say in our finance world, and that will cause customers to say, you know what, just just cancel me. Everything was fine. But you don't know what might wake the sleeping dog. Um, And then the challenge is to figure out who those sleeping dogs are. Are they really as happy as they say they are? One of the challenges we have to overcome a lot, Jeb, is happy talk, because most people, even if, you know, they may not be happy with your solution, they're not really mad at you. So they're going to be nice to you, their their counterpart on the other end of the call. But if you as the customer success agent or even as a salesperson believe that happy talk, you're going to find out the hard way that "Eh, things weren't all that rosy, because, for instance, for us, We live and die by our key performance indicators and our customers, much to the point about whether they want to be a partner or not, they may not know their cost per application. They may not know their cost per hire. They may not know their time to hire, but I'm going to rephrase that. They're going to say they don't know, but our job is then to say, okay, go find the person in your organization who does know, because if you don't know your cost per hire, you're going to say everything's fine. And then your CFO is going to come calling someday and we're going to get fired because we never knew that we were not achieving your cost per hire goal. Um, That real time feedback and having that honest, open dialogue with our customers is incredibly important to keep them happy, keep them engaged and keep them with us. Uh, We talk a lot about that. You know, we can't grow them if we don't keep them. 
So the first thing you got to do is is keep them, yes, and and then and earn the right to gain more budget, gain more trust, and do more business together. Yeah, one of the most profound conversations I ever had as a young professional in my late twenties was with the COO of a of my very large company I worked for at the time, and just happened to get exposed to him, and he was explaining in uh, in enthusiastic terms that you cannot expand, raise prices on, sell more to a customer that you no longer have. So his entire <laughs> focus was retain the customer. Like you, yes. you find a way to keep that customer. And, and one of the things that I learned in working with him is that the easiest way to lose a customer is to ignore them, is to take them for granted. And I'd, I'd like to maybe get your, get your thoughts on that. And I'll just give you some experience from my old days of, of, of uh, running a job board. By the way, the other night ago, I, I started thinking, hey, it's a good time to start another sales job board right now. And I told my wife, who is our CFO, I said, I'm thinking about mm -hmm. maybe like cranking the job board back up again. There's some new technology out there, some things it could do. Mm -hmm. She goes, she goes, you're probably going to need to explain that to your next wife. That's, that's, that's how <laughs> <laughs> no more job boards. But, um, but one of the things that we found when we, back when we had the job board, which we started in 2007 and ran until 2018 was that when, when we had conversations with our customers. If my account manager, which we, our customer success and account management was all wrapped up in one small company. We can't afford to have two different groups. But if, if I overheard their calls and they were calling you up and they say, hey, Barry, how's everything today? And you go, everything's good. And they go, okay, well, yeah. can I do anything for you? And they go, nope. And they hang the phone up. Yeah. I'm probably going to lose that customer. Yes. If, yes. if they called up and said, Hey, I'm taking a look at your, your job posts. And I'm looking at the performance right now. And I don't feel like you're getting the applications that a job like this should get. I'm wondering if you have a few minutes, we could talk a little bit about tweaking the language in your job post, because I think if we change yes. these four things that we're going to get more from you. And what was amazing yes. is if they would have those conversations, customers would almost always go, yeah, let's, let's talk a little bit about it, especially ones yes. that wanted to be a partner. And there were some who would say, nope, that's what my corporate says. There's nothing I can do about it. But that was typically yes. a big company. You're dealing with someone who is really low level in the organization, and they just got told to post it. But, but most of our customers would talk with us. And even, by yes. the way, if that post didn't produce any more applicants for them, they were more likely to post it again to stick with us over yes. the long haul because we were being – we were being part of, of the process. In other words, we weren't yeah. just asking them to be a partner with us. We were actually being a partner with them. And yes. it was just so important that we were, that we were in the weeds with them to, to, and, and, yeah. and, and with our arms wrapped around them, because I mean, from a selling standpoint, I'm sure you've got particular professions that your folks are looking for. Sales is a hard role to, to recruit for. And yeah. it's tough. Like in, you know, mm -hmm. you talk about cost of hire, we would have clients where we would perform, like we would get them applicants and then they wouldn't interview for another 30 days. And then they would say, well, none of the applicants showed up. We're like, right. but wait, this is salespeople. Like if they're, they got hired the first week they were out, you know, you can't wait that yes. long. So we had, a, well, there's a lot of work we had to do to educate. You would think yes. that you're dealing with people. This is what they do. And I love your story about, they don't even know what their cost of hire is. No. That's a lot of work. Talk to me a little bit about this, this concept of being proactive and getting yes. below the surface and, and what you have to do to get below the surface when people say, no, I'm okay. And they just put their hand yes. up and we want to move on. Yeah, it's, it's a great point, Jeb. And, you know, back to one of your first thoughts, you know, just recently I had a conversation with a couple of the folks on my team. I was reading status reports and the commentary was along the lines of, well, they haven't been joining our check-in calls. Um, they're not responding to email. So I'll reach out to them in four to six weeks. And I said, you don't have that option. Yes. That is, that is, that is not your option to do that. Um, you know, the, a disengaged customer has its own challenges. A difficult customer can be a wonderful customer because they are engaged. They're complaining, you know, exactly where they stand. And so then you have the folks who are probably in the middle. And one of the things I speak with my team about a lot is, we, they, my team members don't know it, but we're actually better talent acquisition professionals than the folks we're often speaking with, at least from our area of expertise. We know the technology. We know to how to talk about job titles and job descriptions and things like that. And so earning the customer's trust to first hopefully listen, 
get that person's buy-in and at least to say, I see why we're talking about what we're talking about. I don't know if I can get approval for it, but at least I get it. Our ability to be consultative is really our lifeblood mm -hmm. because we have to be better and we have to be different than the 10 ton gorillas in our space who do want you to set it and forget it. You know, it's, I don't know if people reference Avis anymore. You, you and I are of an age where I can say we try harder or number two. Yeah. I don't know if people say that anymore, but you know, we're not number one. So we do have to try harder and it's in my nature. It's in the, the very DNA of the company to be very customer focused. Um, and I'm very proud when I look at our recent NPS survey, when I look at our G2 reviews, when I look at our Google, re Google reviews, the references are exactly to what you're describing. Our ability to get in and get our hands dirty because if we didn't do that, we would basically set up a, an advertising campaign, watch the numbers and tweak them. Mm -hmm. And customers who had failed with us before or who had failed with others before would fail again because no one's had the tough love conversation that your application is terrible. It's it's four pages long with a 45 minute personality assessment. Yes, it's not it's not mobile friendly. 80% of your traffic's gonna come in on mobile. Oh, by the way, you need a resume. No one has their resume on their mobile device. Um, your, your job titles say things like, you know, front desk concierge. Well, no one's gonna search on that. They're gonna say customer service, you know, or something like that. So um, providing that coaching and those ideas. We had one uh, a well known gig company that was um, having trouble recruiting a more diverse workforce. And one of our very simple observations was, did you notice all your images are a bunch of white men? Yeah. So who do you think? And they were, and to them, this was a huge revelation. They were so grateful for it. We changed the imagery. We actually worked with our own marketing department to help them come up with it. And it was, it was a beautiful, beautiful thing. But if no one had ever said that to them and we're looking at it with fresh eyes, um, they would have had the same struggles. Um, I will often encourage our salespeople who, you know, might get excited. They'll talk to someone who says, well, they don't like fill in the blank, you know, one of our larger competitors. And I always caution them, be careful, dig into that. Because what if it's them, you know, in a George Costanza way, it's, yeah. it's, it's not me, it's you. Or, <laughs> um, what if they just have a lousy experience that they've created for their applicant? We can't work magic. Um, one of the other challenges is we were very sympathetic to our customers who, uh, are trying to recruit in rural areas. That's hard, you know, that, that absolutely hard. We're doing what we can technologically and service wise to help with all that. But, you know, sometimes we'll see customers who say, well, I'm not getting enough respondents to my job ads. We're gonna run a hiring event. And that's beautiful. We have a great hiring events product, happy to help you do that. But the hiring event is not magically going to create job seekers. We can't increase the population of your community. It's the same it's the same employee or candidate base that you're pulling from. So try something new, try something different, that's great. But it's not gonna change the physics of where you live. Um, so trying to find small wins and small areas of consultativeness uh, have really served this well so that we can then e expand the aperture and have folks who really appreciate you know, getting into it with us all the time. Let's brainstorm, let's find solutions. I think that's the, the key. I, I love that you said, you know, find small areas. Because if I have one beef with account managers and customer success uh, in particular, it's that I don't feel like I always have a partner with me that's trying to help me succeed. Yeah. And, yes. and you think about customer success, I help them succeed. And it's, mm -hmm. it's the, the first part of customer success is getting them using your product and getting it built into their workflow so that they believe they can't live without you. And the second part is helping them tweak the service so that they're they're, they're getting more and, and, and more from it. And even like we were, I, you know, I started off talking about Salesgrave University, but Salesgrave University, we have this really cool product called a team hub. So if you're a small business mm -hmm. and you get a small sales team, you really get this incredible product that allows you to get live training, you get masterminds, you get on demand for your team. But if we set it and forget it using your words, which I love, you know, if we, if we mm -hmm. just let people go out to their own device, what happens is, 
the sales team eventually will, you know, they'll they'll drift away and the leader is off doing other things and they're running their their world. They're doing what they were always doing. They want training. They want to make their people better. They know that they need to make their people better. No different than someone knows they need to have better job copy, better a better process for people applying for the job. They get those things, but they got a lot of other things going on in their world. Yes. So our account manager who is assigned to that customer's account, that's the beautiful thing. You get an account manager. If that account mm-hmm. manager is a partner saying, okay, tell me about your business. What are some of the challenges you're facing right now? Let's work together, put a learning path together for your folks. So we take them through a series of courses so that the outcome on the other side is you're solving that challenge. If we're not doing those things, then what happens eventually is that they quit using it. And yes. if, if your customer quits using it, they're going to quit because they're not making, they're yes. not getting any ROI from it. So I think that yes. it like this, it's so important that you're, that you look at yourself as a consultant. Um, Barry, I'm going to, I've got this a question. I want to pull this question here and it's from Raymond and Raymond's account manager. And, and he asked, he says, you know, I've got these customers who are assigned to me, but they won't talk to me anymore. He said, nobody wants to talk. And he goes, I send emails and nobody does anything. My boss is on me. What do I do to get my customer to respond to me? And I, I, I'm sure you've probably heard that before from your own folks. Like you're, you're holding them accountable. You're true. telling them you call people. Um, so, so great question, Raymond. Can you, what would you give, what advice would you give Raymond to get people to respond? You know, it's, it's such a great question. Thank you for sharing it, Jeb. And thank you, Raymond, for, for asking. Um, and I'm sure we can draw a lot of parallels to the non-responsive prospect, right? Because my first reaction is get to them as a person and not as a customer, not as your counterpart. Um, we have an account manager, uh, one of many fine account managers at Telru, who does a wonderful job of saying, I just read this article that I remember from a conversation we had that you might be interested in. And it may be a Taylor Swift article because that's what they talked about. It doesn't have to be the, you know, the latest jobs announcement, that kind of formal professional press release. Trying to reach people at a human level can make all the difference. Um, I will tell you that while it's perhaps uh, not the most elegant thing, send a gift card, yeah. buy them lunch. It's really hard not to say thank you and to engage. And I'll tell you, Jeff, we did uh, several years ago, we were doing our annual NPS survey and for various reasons, it got pushed too late. So we did it much later in the year than I wanted. We were doing it the first week in December. At the same time, we were sending out our holiday gift cards electronically. It was in the age of COVID. We just sent gift cards to everybody. What the same people, we were doing it to buy the results. You know, that that was not the point. It just happened to sync up that way. 100% of my customers opened the gift card. <laughs> And then you're you're going crazy saying, could you open up the NPS survey email, please? Um, but we uh, we use a, a, a service uh, inside Telru as well to help us with this. Send the five dollar uh, gift card for a cup of coffee. Um, buy the group lunch. You know, hey, can we can we get everyone together? We'll do a brown bag educational session. Um, something that's a little bit selfish, a little bit self serving, uh, but reaches someone as a human being. Uh, something that you know they'll appreciate. Send them DoorDash credits if they can have movie night with their kid at home, you know, and get popcorn and food and pizza and stuff. Uh, I think those things can be really good door openers because if you can't get to them professionally, you got to find got to find another way in. I found a video helps. Just shoot a quick video and say, hey, oh, you know, hold yeah. your phone up and go, hey, Barry, I really appreciate yeah. you. Thank you very much. I find that works as yes. well. Something interesting that that I also find, and this is kind of weird now, uh, a little handwritten note helps really just mm-hmm. send a handwritten note that works. We got a, a client the day that it kind of disappeared on us. That was a cl- an account, mm-hmm. but we just hadn't heard from him in a while. We sent them a handwritten note and they, they, they wrote us an email back, but said, thank you for the mm-hmm. note. And we scheduled an appointment to just do a quick account review with them. But one of the things that I found to be really incredible, and I mean, and this is going to be profound. Okay. So hold on. Um, is we had this, this, my account manager, I got this customer. They won't respond to me. They won't respond. To me, we won't respond. We and I'm like, well, we need to get in touch with them because I know when people aren't responding, there's nothing good that comes from people not responding. We need to get in touch with them. I've done everything I possibly can, everything I can. I said, what have you done? Well, I've sent them a bunch of emails and I said, okay, what's their phone number? So mm-hmm. I got the phone number and I picked up my phone and I called and they answered. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, did you do that? Well, yeah. no, because they only prefer to be contacted by email. Mm. Yeah. 
Yeah. So imagine they tell everybody just to contact me by email. So everybody mm-hmm. contacts them by email. That it just gets lost in the noise. So yeah. sometimes I know this sounds weird, Raymond. Try picking up the phone and just call them, and even leave a voicemail message. Uh, real yeah. quickly, Barry. By the way, if you want to ask me a question or ask my guest a question on the Sales Gravy Podcast. You can text your question to 706-397-4599. That's 706-397-4599. When you text it, put podcast in your subject line. That way I'll know it's for the podcast. And uh, and maybe we'll answer your question. Raymond, thank you for the question. Again, 706-397-4599. Thanks for doing that for us, Barry. That was excellent. Terrific. Thank you. Um, Tell me about some trends that you are focusing on your role as an executive running and managing customer success, uh, a customer experience. What are some of the key trends that you're looking at going forward into the, into say the next year or so that you think are going to be impacting both sales professionals and account management, customer success professionals? Yeah. You know, Jeff, it's funny you should ask because we've been talking about probably the key trend that we are seeing, and it is being validated by customers and partners, is that everybody in every vertical is having trouble finding new customers. Um, there's never been a more important time to nurture, to keep the, the customers you have and find ways to grow with them. There has never been a more important time to find the right partners who can enhance your offering or whose offering you can enhance. Um, it is not about going out and capturing new, in our case, new employers or you know, call it a new logo. It's, it's gotten incredibly challenging. Not that it's not going to happen. Of course, salespeople will do what salespeople do, and customers always need new products. But um, building on what you have, and in that sentence, you is everybody, right? What do we already have in-house? Who, uh, If I'm one of our Telru customers, okay, who do I have? Who do I trust? I'm not going to try a new vendor. I'm not going to experiment. It's too risky. You know, my it's I think everyone is hoping that the world of layoffs and stuff will have stopped going into 2024, but people are risk averse. So if I have vendors who I trust, how do I do more with them? And so if your customers are thinking, how can I do more with my existing vendors? It's incumbent upon you as that vendor to find ways for them to work with you. As you were saying earlier, ask the questions. Where is your business going? What are your challenges for 2024? How can we help you? One of the things that I'm always struck by, whether it's my own poor stock market buying decisions, my own poor investment decisions, is assuming that anyone is static, right? When I look back at our portfolio of what we offer, it's completely different than it was two years ago. Your own customers are probably not as in tune with what you are offering and where you are going as you would like them to be. So especially at this time of year, taking time to do Uh, whether you want to call it an annual business review or a quarterly business review, make sure you share the roadmap. And then that roadmap becomes an excuse to talk to folks about what are you doing? Does this sync up? Are we building things that are interesting to you? What do you need uh, that we might, maybe we can't spit it out tomorrow, but what are you looking for that we might be able to enhance our product with? Um, But the acceptance of the fact that growth is going to come from within makes what I do, what my team does, our account managers, more important than ever. Uh, because it's it's a sweet spot. It's gone from being, oh, it, it's nice to keep customers happy. Oh, no, 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 no. There is nothing more important than keeping your customers happy and growing with them. And, you know, we lost a lot of that over the last three or four years and coming out of the pandemic when yes. you, there was a lot of bad behavior. It was, you know, basically yes. throw your customer away, go get the next customer because yes. people were calling you. And suddenly, As crazy as it is, we've actually gotten back to more of a normal where retaining your customers matters. But I I agree with you. I think in in this environment with so much risk in the environment, I I wrote a book called Selling in a Crisis. And at the end of that book, the the last part of that book is about keeping your customers and it's protecting your turf, essentially. I got to make sure that those customers don't get encroached on by my competitors and I've got to make sure that they're good. But you said something that I think is super powerful. It's a great way to end this conversation. That's around looking at your current portfolio. We're so obsessed with going and getting new logos. And I spend a lot of my time, don't get me wrong, I'm I'm the guy that wrote Fanatical Prospecting. So, you know, it is go get new logos. 
Mm-hmm. But there is gold in your existing customer base. And I love what you said about don't assume the customer's static. But you got to go have that conversation. Don't assume they're going to call you. They're, they're thinking about their own world, not you. Call them. Say hello to them. I can't tell you how many times, Barry, I've gone, and I'm sure this has happened to you. I've called up a customer, I don't know, even sometimes just on a whim. Hey, I'm going to be in your city. You want to go have lunch? And yes. they go, yeah, I'll have lunch with you because everybody will take free lunch. Like They'll take a gift yes. card. And you sit down, and at the end of lunch, they've, they've filled up your arms with all of these projects they want you to yes. do for them, all the stuff they need. Yes. And you didn't do anything but just contact them and sit down and have a conversation. And yes. I mean, I can just think about the other night ago, I had dinner with one of my existing customers, like one of my most important customers. And it was just dinner because we're friends. I just like mm-hmm. having dinner with you. At the end of the dinner, I walked out with all of the challenges they're facing in 2024. And guess what? They weren't the same challenges in 2023. So now I've got another meeting scheduled to go spend some time with them to walk through it and, and, and be a real partner and a consultant to find ways to apply training to help them solve that problem. That wouldn't have happened if I hadn't asked the question, right. what's happening in, in 2024. So I think there's a huge opportunity there. And then when it comes to selling, you said something, gosh, you're so smart. You said something so incredible. And that is that people trust vendors they've already worked with and they're risk averse. How many customers have you, you know, lost? And when I say lost, they just quit using you. Think about that mm-hmm. in your database. It's got to be 100,000 or something like that that are there. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. What would happen if you just sat down as a sales rep and said, I'm just going to call all the people who used to do business with me and check on yes. them? What would happen if you did that? Oh, it's a beautiful thing. And in fact, Jeb, we, uh, a, a well-known uh, grocery brand is back live with us. And what I'm really pleased with is how we won them back. We reached out, credit to our account executive and our account manager. But you could reach out and nothing might happen. But what was brilliant was in the time that we haven't been working together, and when you think about was it our fault or theirs that it didn't work the first time, well, they removed the personality assessment from their online application. They no longer require a resume. They've streamlined their hiring practices. They get back to people same day. You know, time is incredibly of the essence these days, especially with frontline and essential workers. And I just had this big smile on my face when I was reading the notes from the sales call because I said, we can be successful with them now. And we've actually set up their advertising campaign exactly the same way it was set up when they ended up leaving us. Because what's changed is on their side. But if we don't pick up the phone and call them, they're not thinking, boy, we really are doing, they don't even know if all these ideas came from Talru. They're thinking, okay, we're ready. We've, we've modernized. We're doing great. Are they going to pick up the phone and call us? No. Well, probably not. You know, they have fond memories of us, but they're not going to pick up, necessarily pick up the phone. And, you know, I was also struck, Jeb, I have two examples from the last two weeks. Um, my CEO and I were in New York having dinner and lunches with some customers, right? There's no substitute for it. You, you have to be top of mind and you, and I always say this and it is so self-evident that I kick myself because it's like, yeah, every time we visit with our customers, we get more business. Duh. You have to stay, you have to stay, stay top of mind. And even if it's like, in our case, we work with a number of advertising agencies and, you know, we know the executives, but it's the frontline account managers who hold the keys to the kingdom and they turn over. So we have to go visit their offices, brown bag lunch those folks, get to know them, send them gift cards, find out what they're interested in because they hold the keys to the kingdom. And when you visit with them, suddenly they know you, they like you, they trust you, and suddenly business comes your way. It's amazing, Um, isn't it? It's crazy. And then the flip side was, the the, I've had a couple of meetings in the last few weeks with uh, some very visible customers, and I have to tell you, I was kicking myself. They did call me. They said, hey, Barry, do you have time? You know, let's do a review before the end of the year. And I was disappointed in myself. I said, why in the world did they have to call me? But the days go fast and the weeks go fast. And what you, you know, to me, the blessing was, God bless, they they called, yep. you know, which which I really appreciate. But that's on me. Um, and, you know, I, as you can tell, it's something I think about and we think about a lot. It's it's we have to know these folks as human beings. We have to have that personal yep. relationship. And I think, I think we're all, I think we're all guilty of it. I know I am. I, I know that I think some days I need to call this customer and then 10 other things happen and I don't. And I, that's, that's yeah. my, if I've got one new year's resolution and there's only one, 
that it's going to be a, a, a much more intentional focus on staying close to my cu- customers and keeping a finger on the pulse and, and at times just saying hello and doing a much better job of when I do have time on my hands, figure it out. Go and get on a plane, get yeah. on a train, you know, get, just go spend time with them because it, it, it works. Get in the car. Uh, it just, it just matters. And, you know, I think, I think I'm, what I love most about this conversation is in the age of AI, and I'm writing a book called The AI, AI Edge right now with my buddy, uh, mm-hmm. Anthony Anarino. In the age of AI, what we've just talked about is the human advantage, right? It's, yeah. the, it's the, the power of spending time with people. And I love, you talked about the like advertising agency, you know, back in my job board days, you know, I'd go to Chicago, go to Boston, whatever, and I'd go mm-hmm. spend time at an ad agency and I'd just meet everybody, mm-hmm. shake hands. And amazingly, the next week I'd be covered up with business. And yes. suddenly they liked me. You know, that was the biggest yes. thing is they were thinking about you and they're the ones talking to their customer and going, hey, I think yes. you should go here. So, yes. and it, like, they weren't going to think of me without being there. How, how important mm-hmm. is that? Hey, um, real quickly, uh, before we take off, um, tell us about uh, your company and, mm-hmm. uh, and, and why, I know everybody's looking for great people and we've got a mm-hmm. whole group of salespeople customer success people, you're in Austin, Texas. So I don't know if your jobs are all in Austin, but, um, but why would someone want to go check out your career site? Why would someone want to get in touch with you on LinkedIn? Why would someone consider Tauru as a place to take their, their sales career, or their customer success career? I, I appreciate uh, the question, Jeb, and I'm proud of where I work. Um, we are mostly in Austin, um, engineering my team, uh, but our, our account executives are, uh, some are in Austin, but happily remote. Um, so that is, uh, we we are a broader geographic employer than we were 10 years ago, which is great. So we have lots of opportunities in that regard. But you know what I'm most proud of? And it again, it sounds glib and trite, but it really is our culture. And, you know, we we really live and die by our company values. And we don't talk about them every day. And you don't necessarily refer to them every day. Um, but I'll, I'll share a moment where, um, and I've been with the company almost seven years now. Uh, we were looking to hire uh, a young lady onto my team from one of our competitors and she had signed a non-compete. Now reality would say, even if they cared, they would send a nasty legal document. Nothing would come of it. She wasn't an executive. It wasn't going to be that big a deal. Um, and I just wanted her to, I believe my words to the executive team were, I just wanted her to sign the damn offer letter. <laughs> I, I wanted her, you know, this is someone I wanted on my team. And it was our CEO, Thad Price, who turned to me and he said, well, Barry, in a situation like that, how would we like to be treated? We would appreciate if the person came to us and said, I have an opportunity with a competitor. Um, you may not give me your blessing, but I'd like to pursue this opportunity and I don't want to do it behind your back. Um, I said, damn it, you're right. <laughs> and so I called uh, the then candidate, now employee, and I asked her if she wouldn't mind doing that. She, to her credit, she said, yeah, I'm, I'm happy and proud to do that. And she went to HR and she basically got blown off. Like, well, go talk to our corporate attorney and the attorney didn't want to hear from her. So we did our due diligence. You know, we did the right thing. We raised the flag and she's been happily working with us for two and a half years now. But I rarely feel like I have moments of, ethical dubiousness. And it was really comforting to have a boss who says, well, wait a minute, how would we want to be treated? And that's just one small example of things that really pervade our corporate culture uh, and how we really do stick to our values. Um, and I'm, I'm proud of that. Perfect. And I was going to, sp- I'm going to make sure I get this right, but the name, the, the way you spell your company is T-A-L-R-O-O. Is that correct? That's correct. So if someone wanted to go check out careers, it would be, is it, is it Talru.com slash careers? Is that how, how you I believe that? so. Yeah. It's easy enough to find you yeah, at com slash careers um, on, on LinkedIn. Um, I'm, I think I am the Barry Klein. <laughs> so <laughs> I should be easy enough to find. Um, but yeah, there's the, the website is robust, tells you a lot about the, uh, the solutions, uh, a lot of great customer stories. Um we, we've been very fortunate recently, Jeb, to get uh, a number of our customers on, uh, on video, Good. Um, just saying the most marvelous things. I just, I watch that over and over. That's just, that's just my happy thing to watch the, those videos over and over. But there's lots of customer stories about the solution, about employment. Uh, so a lot of folks can learn if they're interested. 
Awesome. Very good. Talru.com forward slash careers. Go check out Barry on LinkedIn. He's a good dude. And you're, uh, if you're looking for a career, great place to work. And folks, listen, if you've never taken a course on Salesgrave University, we are the most powerful sales training engine on earth, period. Go check it out. Go to learn.salesgravy.com. That's learn.salesgravy.com. And I'll tell you, you might want to sign up for a mastermind group. You can use the code free course if you've never taken a course. And mastermind groups are a great opportunity for you to get together with a bunch of salespeople or sales leaders from different companies, different industries, and talk about the biggest challenges that you're facing and solve them together. They're really fun. And you may end up on the Sales Gravy podcast because I typically go work with at least one group a quarter, and we uh, we record it. So you can go back and listen to some of their questions. If you've never taken a course before, use the code free course. Go to learn.salesgravy.com, learn.salesgravy.com, and we'll see you next time on the Sales Gravy Podcast.